You're now watching the Mike Missanelli Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Good afternoon, everybody. It is the Mike Missanelli Podcast. Not in a good mood today. Uh, just like all Eagle fans throughout the Delaware Valley are not in a good mood. They got demolished yesterday by the San Francisco 49ers, who were hell-bent on revenge after they bitched and moaned for one year straight. And even in the last week, couldn't hold up uh, their trash talk with Debo Samuel. And they, guess what? They walked the walk. They came into Lincoln Financial Field and smashed the Eagles 42 to 19. Now, listen, we looked at the game. We saw the line of the game. We knew it was probably a precarious situation for the Eagles. I did not expect a beatdown. And this opens the door to major questions about what the Philadelphia Eagles are right now. And we're going to get to all of them. Here uh, is the big question for me. Can the Eagles now go to San Francisco to win an NFC title game? We talked last week about this would be one of the ramifications if they lost this game and somehow managed to lose control of that number one seed, which still has to play out, by the way. Yesterday didn't decide that, and we'll get into that in a second. But I just want you to close your eyes and picture it now If it winds up where the 49ers and the Eagles wind up with the same league record and the Niners win the tiebreaker as we go through the playoffs and these teams keep winning, the inevitable path is Eagles and 49ers NFC title game in San Francisco. All right, so just put that on hold for a second because here's the bigger question about this. And and let let me just say that the game next week against Dallas can take that out of the equation. All right. I'm not, listen, I'm not giving them three losses automatically. Their third loss would have to come next week against the Cowboys. But the backdrop of that is when we looked at the schedule and we always looked at the schedule, we go, when's the, you know, normally the the, the Dallas Cowboys and Eagles are going to split during the regular season. I don't know when the last time the Eagles swept the Dallas Cowboys. I haven't done the research on that. And it is very possible that they can go down to Dallas and win that game, which would really ease the pain of this particular loss. But here's the bigger question. And you saw it yesterday. And I think we've been conning ourselves this whole year about how good the Eagles' defense is. They're not good beyond their front line. They're mediocre beyond their front line. And and here's what I saw yesterday. If they're not getting pressure on the quarterback, then they're not stopping anybody on the back end. And the 49ers played that up to a T. They had a great combination of run and pass. Didn't do anything that dramatic. He made all the throws that he needed to make, the short throws, the little slants. They exploited the middle of the field. That's what he does. But let's face it. If they're not getting home and getting pressure on the quarterback, they've got inferior linebackers. Their corners have not played that great. Their safeties have not played that great. Their slot corners have not played that great. So that's what I saw yesterday. They got exposed in the middle of the field, and this is problematic against a good team. Now, I didn't want to believe the people that were saying this whole year, including my partner on the post game show, Seth Joyner. I, you know what? They play a good team. This stuff is going to come back and haunt them. Yeah, yeah. Everybody looks at, it. yeah, well, they won the game. That's the most important thing. But sometimes the manner of how you win the game is an important thing, too. And so when you measure them up against good teams, and frankly, there's only two teams that they have to worry about in the NFC. And the 49ers are certainly one of them, and the Cowboys are the other. So it's not like uh, they've opened a, you know, this Pandora's box to the, that they're going to lose to anybody that they play. They're not. They're still among the top teams in the NFC. There are three of them. You can count them. There's the 49ers and the Eagles and the Cowboys, and that's about it. And I'm not going to give any respect to the Lions right now. So um, that's the big question on on the backdrop here of of this game. Uh, I don't know what to think about them right now when I project what the season is supposed to be because we're not looking at them finishing with a certain record at the end of the season. I mean, that'll be wonderful, right? They finish with a 14 and three record that looks on the surface like it's good. However, if that's a 14 and three where they don't get the number one seed and they have to go to San Francisco. And I do believe that's going to be what happens because the Cowboys have a couple games that I believe they're going to lose on their schedule. So they're going to be taken out of the equation, even if they beat the Eagles next week. So I'm focused on that team that wore the red yesterday. Now, if we look at the game and the way it started, And we're going to get into this whole thing. 
But obviously, in this game, the Eagles did not take advantage of their first two possessions. They went on two 12-play possessions to start the game. They only got six out of it. And more egregious one was where they didn't get the touchdown on their second drive because they had the 49ers in flux. The 49ers didn't look like they knew what was going on uh, in the first part of that game. In the first quarter of the game, minus six total yards for the 49ers, and then all of a sudden the floodgates open because the Eagles did not put that kind of pressure on them. The Niners made a couple of stops which energized them defensively, they energized the offense. And so the offense not being behind by a couple of scores, maybe you get 13 and nothing or even 14 and nothing. Instead, we're in a manageable position. And then they got cooking because they started running the ball. And they've got two dynamic weapons that the Eagles could not stop yesterday. Okay. Forget about Purdy, who's been amazing and, and amazingly efficient. But Debo Samuel, who talked the most trash, busted they ass yesterday. And so did Christian McCaffrey. And I understand there aren't many backs in the league like Christian McCaffrey, but they ran the ball at the Eagles. And when the Eagles have a four-man front, you're out going to be able to run against them. The only way they can stop the run is with a five-man front. And with a five-man front, that depletes them on the back end. So they've got a whole bunch of problems right now when you measure them against a good team. All right, let me get to one more issue, uh, and then we're going to go rehash this game uh, in its uh, entirety and to uh, look at the things that went wrong and the things that uh, that should have happened in the game. There is, is, of course, a lot of people are talking about it today, even nationally, is the big Dom DeSandro issue on the sidelines. And, and I'm going to give you my honest opinion. I'm not going to hold back, and I'm not going to be a Philadelphia homer because I've seen on social media how Philadelphia fans love to pump their muscles when it comes to stuff like that. Oh, we're doing the same thing. Oh, blah, blah. You know, it's it's that false bravado that we sometimes get involved in. It's Philadelphia. I get it. That doesn't make it right. On that play, obviously, Dre Greenlaw gets the flag already for slamming Devontae Smith to the ground. There is no way, and Dom DeSandro has no business being involved in that scrum on the sidelines. Has no business doing it. And I know people look at it like, yeah, he's sticking up for our team, yeah. He is the director of security for the team. Basically, he's on the sidelines to protect Nick Sirianni. I don't know why. I don't know why Nick Sirianni needs constant protection on the sidelines, but he's a presence, and he's been there for a lot of years, and everybody loves Big Dom. I get it. He's the fixer. He's Winston Wolf. I understand what he does for the Eagles. He should not be involved in a football situation. He is not a coach, and I looked at that, and I said, that's embarrassing. And, and the other guy, the coach on the other side, was right to point it out. And so what happens is Greenlaw gets thrown out of the game. He did what he did, okay? He's the idiot that cost his team by getting thrown out of the game, by going back at Dom DeSandro. DeSandro shouldn't be get, coming in there saying, hey, that's bullshit, and, and, and using his hand to push away Greenlaw. I can't believe that that happened. And so uh, he gets th thrown out of the sidelines, but that was a better trade. For the Philadelphia Eagles, obviously, because they got a premier linebacker out of the game. And that gave them momentum. And they went down and they scored after that. I get it. I thought it was disgraceful that the guy got involved. He is not a coach. He does not belong close to that play. He's a guy that should be in the background and not be involved in it. Now, I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me. And I read, you know, I look at social media. Uh, like all that, but I just had to get this off. I said it last night on the post game show when it happened. I said, what is he doing in there? He doesn't belong in there. Get out of there. Come on, dude. You got to be smarter than that. You can't be this, this macho Philadelphia Rocky character and influence a game. It looks bad. And we're going to see what's going to happen. Maybe they do suspend him. I mean, that kid that gave the cell phone to Tyreek Hill he got, got fired because he got involved in the game, and he had no business being involved in the game. So we'll see what happens. But let me go to producer Darren. Uh, the Dom DeSandro issue aside, what was your reaction? Because you were at the game, and it, it must not have been very fun to be in that stadium. <laughs> it was one of the most miserable experiences of my life yesterday. It really was. All day, just miserable. But it, real quick on the Dom thing, um, he, you're right. He has no business being there. My question is, what is his role on the sideline? Because I talked to a couple people this morning that tell me that 
sideline security is 100% part of his job description. Now, I don't think that means getting in the face of another player. Even if that means, even if you want to stretch that as far as you can stretch it, his only job at that point is to grab his own player, maybe, and pull his own player off the field. Not go at it and he touch it. He doesn't have any business player. touching his own player. He's not a coach. What does sideline security mean? It means nothing. It means That's nothing to question. the game. It has nothing to do with the game. I agree. I just don't know how his role is defined by this team. Because Dom seems to have his should, in Listen, over. forget about how the team defines him. The league defines it. There is no other team that's going to have somebody who is not intimately involved with the team on the coaching staff get involved in something like that. He's an ornament on the sidelines. He should not even be close to any kind of a situation with a player. What does sideline security mean? He's got to police the game, including the players on the field? Stop it. Let's get let's drop this subject. I want to, I want to get your right, analysis of the game. I thought, all right, so there's a couple things with this game. The, 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 they lost this game for two main reasons. And I'm, we'll talk about the injuries and the health status of this team in a minute. But the weak point of the San Francisco 49ers is their offensive line. They've got an all-pro, all-world right tackle and four other guys who might start for Temple. So they did not take advantage of what their weak point was. Not enough stunts, not enough blitzes. They should have been all over that offensive line. And the other thing is defensively, and yes, these linebackers were lost. Morrow looked like he had never, he hadn't played a game in 15 years. He was being turned around. He was missing tackles, whiffing open, open field. Even when he did make contact, God forbid he rap. The tackling on that for this team yesterday was atrocious. You have to tackle better. You have to tackle a top team. A team with Debo Samuel and Christian McCaffrey and George Kittle. You can't just bump into these. All right, let's let's look. That is in the that is in the Jets offense out there. Let's That's not the let's look, Colts let's look offense closer there. at this. Are you trying to get blood from a stone? Those guys are what they are. All three of those linebackers, including Cunningham, didn't play because of an injury yesterday. We're not part of the original roster. They were at it because guy because of attrition at the position. These guys aren't NFL quality players. They were forced into battle, which brings up the bigger issue. For I years agree. and years and yes. years, the Eagles have shirked that position. Now, that's correct. listen, I get that they have a priority scheme. Their priorities are that that's not an important position. That running back is not an important position, and their priority positions don't include those two positions, especially linebacker. So here we are right now when their middle of the field is exposed, when they can't use a four-man front because a good rushing team will chop it up. That's the issue right now. The Eagles can't do anything about it, except they have to sign Shaq Leonard, and we don't even know if he can play anymore. But they put themselves in a desperate situation, just like they put themselves in a desperate situation, and they had to bring in Bradley Roby. And then they had to bring in Kevin Byer. And now the same thing is happening to the Eagles, where they're going to have to bring in Shaq Leonard. They, they have no choice but to bring him in. And he's sitting there going, oh, my value just went up. Looky here. I could dangle. I have my sign with the Cowboys. And the Eagles go, wait, we need a guy. <laughs> Yeah, you would have thought that, the, that Shaq Leonard with an injured back is is now could be the possible. They're desperate. They, they, they oh, put we're... themselves in that situation. Now, they they drafted a linebacker a couple of years ago. It hasn't worked out. I don't even know if the guy can play. We haven't even had a chance to see him play, the Kobe Dean, because of the injury factor. But I firmly believe he can play. He just needs a little Okay, I, I don't believe he can play. I don't believe he's fast enough to, to make the difference in NFL, but that's beside the point. Look where they are right now with Christian Ellis and Nicholas Morrow. Oh, brutal. And and now so you're coming bad. down the home stretch. Now they can survive with these guys in the regular season. I'm only worried about one thing. When you have a really good team, the only thing that it boils down to what what matters most, and in fact, it's the only thing that matters, is your team good enough to win the big prize? So the steps to that are okay. We would really have an advantage if we had home field advantage throughout and host an NFC title game at home. But this situation now puts that in peril. And the Cowboys game becomes a must-win next week. And how can we count on the Eagles beating 
the Dallas Cowboys twice in one year, especially at a place where the Cowboys have won 14 straight games. Your thoughts? It's a huge game. And, yeah, you and I talked about last week this team losing. I said at the time this team losing back-to-back games was preposterous. How could we even possibly entertain the fact Given they've been, they're ten and one this year. They hadn't lost a home game in, in over a calendar year, and so I look. Sunday's the biggest game of the year. I get it, but there's still four weeks of the season. There's still a whole month of the season after Sunday, and a lot of things can happen. The league itself is a week. You think the 49ers are without a doubt going to run the table? I doubt it. They've already lost three games this year. Injuries they lost happened. three games because they were missing their two key players. Exactly, and you think they, they have not lost when Trent Williams healthy? and Debo Samuel have been there. They've they've got one tough game left against the Ravens. That's all they have. The Cowboys have considerably tougher games. I'm not even worried about the Cowboys. I think the Cowboys will play themselves out of that situation. The 49ers are a different story. They are, and they showed yesterday, the best team right now in the NFC. I agree with that. Okay, I can't argue well, then that's what worries me, because inevitably, to, to get to a Super Bowl, you're going to have to beat them there. And from what we saw yesterday, the superior team then at home in an NFC title game with NFC title game revenge. Yesterday was mild revenge. NFC title revenge is a different story when you're playing it at home. This is what the Eagles have, and it's a shame, because we were coasting along here. And that's why people looked at this game, ah, you know what, they can afford to lose. No, they couldn't. They couldn't afford to lose if you're looking at the big picture. So let's let's go into this Who's game. Health, uh, though, chapter Mike? and verse. It's all health. Who's health? Uh, let's start. Let's start off. Obviously, the Eagles get into the red zone on, on their first drive of the game. They get three big third down conversions. And everybody's going, woohoo, looky here. Because 12 straight red zone drives for the Eagles had resulted in touchdowns. All right. They don't get it. They go up 3 nothing. Okay. I'm okay. You get points on the board. They come right back down the field after they get the Niners to go 3 and out. And they have another drive. And this is the drive that bothered me. Because when I'm looking at the drive, they converted a third and three. They converted a third and five. They're at the 29-yard line. They get a short pass to, to A.J. Brown. They're at the 14-yard line here. And then um, they, they go backwards. And, and uh, it's, Hertz gets sacked for 15 yards. Now, it's third and 21 at the 29. You've already got a field goal in the bag. I don't understand why the play isn't to throw the ball into the end zone at that point to try to make a strike. Instead, they do a check down short left side to Kenny Gainwell for eight yards. And they squander a chance to score a touchdown, which at the time you go, wow, but they're really holding the 49ers. And I'm thinking... The 49ers are eventually going to figure this out. I don't know what the hell they're doing on offense right now, but they're eventually going to figure it out. And they figured it out by running the ball to the left with Christian McCaffrey. And so when you squander what should have been a 14-point lead or, or even a, a 10 nothing lead, that team, you allow that team to come back and take control. And, of course, in the second quarter, the 49ers, who had minus six yards in the first quarter, Rally for 173 yards in the second quarter. They get the touchdown that puts them ahead. They get another one that puts them ahead 14 to 6 with, with a, a, a 10 play 90 yard drive, uh, I might add, uh, with McCaffrey on the three yard run. Uh, and then uh, they go and they hit that guy. They got that touchdown uh, right before halftime to go up 14 to 6. That was key for me because now they've got a little bit of a comfortable lead. But I thought it was really unusual that Eagle fans booed as they were coming off the field. Now, the game is 14-6. to I I understand that they're disappointed that they didn't score touchdowns. It's a one-score game at that point. Were the boos appropriate? You were were in the stadium? Were you booing? No, I was not booing. Um, Okay. What did you think when you heard the fans boo them as they went into halftime? Honestly? Here's what I thought. It's a 425 game. It's 7 o'clock at night. People have been drinking since 8 o'clock in the morning. That's what I thought. You want to know what I thought? That's what I thought. People were, All right. people were pissed. Uh, They're drunk. Fine. I, I, listen, this is a team that game after game, they've made adjustments in the second half, and they've come back. Like I, I don't understand the reaction 
going into the half. Now, had you been able to project the future and see the second half in your brain, then the booze would have been appropriate going into the first half. I want to bring one thing to your attention, Mike, because a lot of people talk about Hassan Reddick and why he's underpaid and this and that. And you mentioned something last night that's been bothering me for a while with him. You mentioned something, I'm sorry, just now. They, 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 they ran left, second quarter, third quarter. McCaffrey left all day. It bothers me. And this is why Hassan Reddick doesn't get the Bosa deals and the, and the end of the world deals, right? Because he is a left and only. You can't move him around. God forbid they, they're able to move Hassan Reddick to the right side in game or over center. He is such an athletic talent. Why don't they move him? Is he well, not capable? But, but I don't know that, right he's, side he's bend? that Maybe? he's that great in the running game. I mean, he's, he's strictly a pass rusher. I don't It'll know if he's going to help, he's help with the Christian side, McCaffrey. I mean, again, Josh Sweat. Josh Sweat's a pretty good player. He should be capable of stopping a run on that Josh side. Sweat. So, so, so Josh tackle. Sweat is the benefactor of other very, very good players. Okay. Uh, in any event, the 49ers, first drive of the third quarter results in another touchdown. And the big play in this game is what we're talking about. Ellis trying to cover McCaffrey out of the backfield. Uh, or, or was that Morrow? I, I forget who it was. But uh, McCaffrey gets out of the backfield on a linebacker, gets a 32-yard gain. They get it to the 12, and Debo Samuel has the reverse and the, the, the jet sweep reverse. For the touchdown. Um, he, I'm looking at this statistic. It said Jalen Hurts has had six straight wins when facing a 10 point deficit. So at 21 to six, I'm going, well, that's a little more than 10. Uh, so we'll see what happens. And what happens is a little bit of a momentum switch because Trey, Trey Greenlaw, who's a very good linebacker, their linebackers are exceptional. There's a difference between the 49ers linebackers and what the Eagles do. Gets a little crazy, lets emotions get the best of him, and slams Devontae Smith. A total a, a needless play, which flags 15 yards, and then he gets into the scrum with the Sandro. There's another 15, and he gets thrown out of the game. Uh, and so the momentum of that, because the crowd is now buzzing, they love that kind of thing, and they get it to 21 to 13 because the tush push twice, they run it, uh, and they complete the drive. Uh, and it's 21 and 13. Now here's where your defense has to stop, uh, step up. You desperately need a stop here. And the 49ers answered. And it was a great answer. The 49ers came right down the field. McCaffrey had a big run. And they hit Debo uh, in the middle. He shakes off Morrow. 48-yard gallop for the touchdown. In that play, if you look at the replay, there may have been a hold on Blankenship, who came over to try to make the tackle. Not called. It's 28 to 13. That was their fourth straight TD on four straight possessions. Uh, and at that point, you're, you're, you're not, you're thinking, okay, well, this is not their day. And it turned out not to be their day because the Eels had a punt on the next drive and, and the Niners drove again. This is at the point in time where Hertz goes into the locker room and there with a little concussion protocol. And they're thinking, well, that's, this is wor the worst thing that could happen here. He, he gets banged up. He might, he missed the Dallas game. All of a sudden, he comes out like a hero and gets back into the game. And the issue at that point, once the 49ers went ahead 35 to 13, when Juwan Jennings shoved Eli Ricks right out of the way to score that touchdown. Uh, why was Hurts still in the game at that point with about five and change left? They're down 35 to 13. Sometimes Sirianni plays macho games, and I don't like it. I can tell you that Mariota did come in for a snap. I didn't know where. You're in the stands. You're not privy to everything. So my cousin texts me. He says, hey, uh, Hertz is in concussion protocol. And I see Mariota trudge out onto the field, at which point I turned to my daughter and said, let's go. We're out of here. I can't watch this guy. <laughs> I can't watch Mariota. So, yeah, I don't know why at that point, I guess, there's a lot of guys that should not have played those last few minutes. DeAndre Swift should not have been in there. They treat him like kid gloves for three and a half quarters, and you got him in there with three minutes left, and you're down by 20. I don't get that at all. All right, that, that's, uh, you raised a good point. Anyway, the 49ers, um, the Eagles did score with Hurts in the game. They didn't get the two point conversion, meaningless touchdown. All the all the stuff is just like you know, it's 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 backwash at this point because the 49ers score again in the Debo on a bubble screen, which made it six straight possessions to get them to 42. 
Uh, if you look at the game statistics, you'll see that DeAndre Swift carried the ball six times. Now, I understand that you're behind in this game, but you're only behind by eight at halftime. And then once you get the touchdown at the DeSandro thing, you're still in the game. And the thing that bugs me about the Eagles and Brian Johnson or Nick Sirianni, who's ever cultivating this attack, is that they don't milk the run. What what they do is if the run is stopped, they get away from it. Now, how many running backs do you see get stopped a lot, and all of a sudden they'll break? DeAndre was the type of guy that if you if you get him, the, you know the the Zeke, if you feed him from the bowl, you, you're maybe going to get a thirty yard pop out of it, but you got to feed him like Zeke, right? <laughs> feed me, and they don't do that, and they didn't do it yesterday, and then the game got out of hand. Of course, they couldn't run the ball, but there were two occasions in the game, down eight at halftime, adjust, maybe establish the run, which they've done many times before, and then uh, certainly when they closed the gap after that uh, green law situation. Yeah, when they, they don't run the in- ball, when they're not running the ball, right? They're not running the ball. There's no Dallas Goddard. The offense is unrecognizable to me. Like, I don't even know what they're trying to do. I, I don't know what they're trying to establish. I really don't. It, you know, in the NFL, in the pro level, you have to establish a rhythm. How many times this, this month have you and I talked about this offensive coordinator fails to establish a rhythm? You're not going to run yeah. the ball. You don't have your all-world all tight end. You better establish the run because as good as Brown and, and Smith are, you can't rely on those two, and that's it. All okay. right, so um... – What's done is done, and as they said in Goodfellas many times, and, and, and that's that, and, and, and could do nothing about it. And, and so now Dallas Goddard, the potential is that he will be back, which is a huge addition because they look lost in balance without him. They can't get the ball to the tight ends. They don't even attempt to throw the tight ends. He's so much uh, of their well-rounded uh, three-receiver type of situation. Um, that we'll see that that gives them an advantage. Uh, the, the line next week, Cowboys are – a regular home field favorite at three. So I'm not getting any indication from the line, but it is a must win for the Eagles. If they want to get the number one seat, it's just simple as that. If they lose that game next week, which was what, so I was so afraid of this game because I'm just doing it logically. How many times are you going to beat the Cowboys twice? Nobody, not even the staunchest Eagle fan looks at that schedule and goes, okay, well they'll, they'll sweep the Cowboys. What they say is, well, we'll split with the Cowboys. We'll sweep the, the, the Commanders. We'll sweep the Giants. They never say we'll sweep the Dallas Cowboys. So that's got me a little nervous, especially that they play well down there. Conversely, they haven't really beaten anybody in that streak, that home streak. So uh, that's what it comes down to. But uh, I was afraid, and I talked about it for many days. That if you lose this game, you can't look at it. Uh, it's like losing this game. You got to look at it like, Wow, I got to win in San Francisco, the NFC title game, to get to the Super Bowl. We'll see if that happens. There's many a slip from cup to lip, a wise man once told me. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds pretty good. All right, so they got waxed 42 to 19. It's time to go around the NFL on the Mike Missinelli podcast, brought to us by Bet Rivers. Now let's go around the NFL. The New England Patriots lost six to nothing. Now, I don't know how it's possible for players to actually tank a game. I think the coaches can influence the game like you can lose by playing the wrong people or doing the wrong schemes or whatever. I mean, that's an investigation that's way beyond my pay grade. But losing 6 nothing, and, and forget the other team. The other team's disgraceful, too. That team can only score six points, right? They win, they win 6 nothing, so they stay in line with the number one draft pick. And I'm looking at myself, I go, if I'm Robert Kraft, do I want Bill Belichick to be the head coach of this team with a new quarterback that you have to then cultivate for several years? By that time, Belichick would be 107. And I'm going, if I'm Kraft, I got to have a conversation and I got to farm him out. I got to say, Bill, this is the time for us to move on because I want to get a younger head coach who's a little quarterback savvy, who can cultivate the number one draft pick, whether it's Caleb Williams or whoever it's going to be for them. I can't have Belichick be the coach of a new era. I just can't. The time is done for Bill Belichick, and I think he should realize that, and he should be calling Josh Harris 
who uh, loves his big names and convinced Josh that he should be coach of the Washington Commanders, who probably need that kind of direction because Rivera is going to go. All right, so just keep that in mind. Number two, the Lions go to nine and three. Now, they had a big lead over the Saints. They squandered it. They had to hold on for dear life to beat the Saints, who stink. That's Darren's favorite team, but they smell. So they wound up winning. They are now nine and three. So my question is this. You know, I'm talking about the playoffs and how the Eagles are going to get to the MC title game in San Francisco. Darren, I'll ask you this question. Are they in peril right now if they face the Lions in the playoffs? No, because I'm as good as he's played, as better as he's played, I should say. I do not worry about Jared Goff at Lincoln Financial Field. There's no team I really worry about. All right, so you're saying the Lions can't beat the Eagles, probably will have to be in Lincoln Financial Field. If the game is at Detroit, what do you think? I still think they win the game. Okay, and I I agree with you. I don't think the Lions are in the same category. But I think this has opened up now a different mindset. We never even thought about that. All of a sudden, we look up, and the Lions have only three losses. They're probably going to lose another game the rest of the season, so that'll take care of that. All right, number three. It's still a month and a half of this season, man. A lot can happen. Like how? What can happen? The Eagles are. What, what are the they, Eagles? They're not going to lose. you all the time. Like, there what, is what are they, what's more the, important the worst the thing that the help. Eagles could nothing. do here? What, the Eagles are going to lose what? Two more games? I'm, I'm not saying them. I'm saying any team, other team you're worried about. Look, the Eagles are a deep team. They're not as deep as the Niners, but after the 49ers, they're the deepest team. Okay? That's because there's so many bad teams in the NFL. Health, Mike. It's who is the healthiest team in the playoffs. Don't worry well, about it. Right well, 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 number one team, but don't worry about any I of don't understand what Lions, your point is here. Packers. We're, we're only talking. I only asked you whether the Lions are in that play. We've decided already. There are only three teams in the NFC. So what is so your I know, point? You here? said there's a lot. You know, you're worried about other teams. All of a sudden, you're looking up. And I, I'm not worried. Back. I'm saying there's only one other team that has a record that puts them in that realm. To okay. me, that's an inferior team that's not akin to the 49ers, Eagles, or Cowboys. I'm just asking you the question. I got it. All right, let's move on. Aaron Rodgers. I'm tired of your bullshit, Aaron. I, I really am. You've been dangling this crap about you wanting to come back. I, uh, who doesn't know that you want to make yourself the story so people talk about you, that that you would actually come back now to play for this crappy team and risk getting injured again? You dangled this and conned us the whole season. When I know your scheming little ass is looking at it and going, I'm only coming back. We've got a playoff chance. You think I'm coming back with this losing record? So stop it. Come out and say, you know what? I'm done for the season. I'm tired of you. I'm tired of Pat McAfee. I'm tired of all your enablers. There. Number four. Could possibly agree more. I always, I've been saying this is the biggest non-story of the league this year. There was no way he was coming back. The Packers. They were a playoff. Over the Chiefs yesterday, um, <laughs> the the AFC stinks too. All right, I don't. I look at the teams in the AFC. I go, who, who in the hell in that conference is reliable? The Ravens, the Chiefs. They're no longer reliable. Who are we talking about? This is the NFC's year, and the Chiefs to lose. I don't know if anybody saw the end of that game. You didn't, Darren. You probably caught them coming back. Two of the worst official calls you could ever you could ever see. First of all, they call personal foul when Mahomes got rocked out of bounds when he was still in bounds. To, to, it was almost like, yeah, well, hey man, we, if the Chiefs can't lose, we got to make this call. But then there was a pass interference call that would have benefited the Chiefs that they didn't call, and the Chiefs do get one chance to win the game, and the pass is incomplete, and they wound up losing. They're not the same. They're not the same. They're no longer feared as the same. And nobody in the AFC, frankly, if you want to say the Ravens, you want to crown the Ravens, you want to crown the Miami Dolphins, then crown them, as Dennis Green would say. All right, number five. Oh, 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 oh. There is one person in America that probably picked this game. The Cardinals go into Pittsburgh and beat the lousy Steelers. And my man, Kenny Pickett gets hurt. He gets dragged off. They get put some shlemiel in there to finish the game. It was Mitchell Trubisky, by the way. Uh, and um, this is a time I think I should remind people that uh, we have a national contest at Bet Rivers where all our national hosts from around the uh, the nation, from Chicago, from Cleveland, from L.A., to, 
uh, and, and we we have a a picking contest. It's a pick five contest, and we pick five games a week. For the second week this year, Darren, Mikey Miss with a five and zero oh slate, including taking the Cardinals with some points. I don't know what the points were when we went off to beat well the to, to to cover against the Steelers. Five and zero, oh, thanks to my favorite team. The Arizona Cardinals. Gladiators, I salute you. <laughs> All right. Let's close it out. Thank the great people of Bet Rivers and my 5-0 and oh, Sterling Week. 5-0, and oh, you, you, you creeps out there who got trying to go against the king of predictions. Come on now. Mark Schlereth is in the contest. Come on, Stink. You, you got to up your game. I went 5-0. and oh. Anyway, later in the week, we will have another podcast for our preview of the big Cowboys game, biggest game of the year. We've now gotten three really big games, the Buffalo Bills, the San Francisco 49ers, and the Dallas Cowboys. If that game on its face is not big enough, the, the ramifications of this game, uh, what's at stake, huge. Uh, so you that know, game, you know, it's again, been exhausting afternoon, for us. Sunday afternoon game. Because of all, all the thought we had to put in each week for these big games. Just imagine, now people, because they the Eagles looked exhausted in the second half on Sunday. They really did. The whole defense looked tired. Particularly, even the offense looked tired. They just looked exhausted. They were out of it. Uh, so you know, uh, people out there feel for us. You know, those us broadcasters that have to work hard for these big game yeah. after big game after big game. It's yeah. tough for us. Yeah, they're not feeling it. They're not feeling it for us at all. Uh, yeah. But that's okay. Uh, we bring you the info. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Uh, tell your friends and neighbors. Just download it and subscribe to it. And you get it for free in your inbox every week. It is the Mike Vicinelli Podcast brought to us by Bet Rivers. You can check me out uh, on Twitter at MikeMiss25. You can email me, Mike at MikeMiss.com. It's, uh, it's holiday season. And I want to like to make a big push for my children's book. It'd be a great little stocking stuffer for your little child. Uh, just learning to read, or you can read it to them. Uh, the Adventures of Shima the Shiba. You can get it on Amazon.com. And also, don't forget Cameo.com. Put in my name, Mike Missanelli. I will give you a personal shout out. Yes, a little holiday message. I spread the good tidings all over the Delaware Valley. All right, everybody, have a great rest of the day. Have a great week. We will catch you later in the week on the Mike Missanelli podcast. Catch you then. Bye-bye, everybody.